All right. Uh, welcome back. Uh, let's talk about the shell. So the shell's main job uh, is to run programs. And there are three main areas uh, in which the shell can influence the behavior of a program. And those are uh, the environment, uh, the arguments, and the file descriptors. Um, let's talk about the environment first because that's the easiest one uh, to explain. So what is the environment? <clears throat> well, the environment is a set of variable assignments that a program can use to influence its behavior. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first things first, uh, how do we see what the environment is? Well, if you just type env with no arguments, right, nothing after it, uh, this will list everything that by default your shell puts in the environment of commands that you run. Um, if you want to know which environment variables can affect the behavior of a program, you need to look at its manual page. So if we type man ls, um, we're looking for a section that says environment. Now you could just sort of scroll through to try and find it, uh, but if you type colon t and then environment, it'll take you right to the section if it exists. And so you can see there's a list of variables here that you can use uh, to affect the behavior of LS. <clears throat> so then the question is, how do we pass you know, extra environment variables uh, to a program? And you've got a couple options here. Um, if you want an environment variable to be used just for the next, just for one command, um, what you can do is you can type something like, you know, columns equals 52 L and then the program that you want to run. So <clears throat> this, you know, environment variable value and then program that you want to run. And you can see that this limits the output of LS to 52 characters in width, um, which is uh, half of my screen. So if you look up here in the top right, you can see that I've got 104 characters of width normally. Um, but the next time you run ls, it won't use that environment variable. So it only gets put in the environment one time. Um, another way that you can do this is uh, doing something like inv columns equals 52 ls. Um, you know, same thing. Uh, the nice thing about the inv command is that you can uh, <clears throat> influence, uh, it gives you total control over the environment. So you can pass inv the dash i flag and it will like wipe the environment and only include these things or the environment variables you specify on the command line in the environment, which you can't really tell from this, but I've written a program that will list everything that's in the environment, um, like env does when passed no parameters. And you can see that, you know, normally it has a pretty large environment, but if we do env i, it has a null environment. So, You can totally control the environment of programs that you run using the env command. The last way that you can influence the environment, uh, if you want a certain environment variable to be set uh, for every command, you can use the export command. So doing something like export test equals, and then I'll do a bunch of twos to make it easily easy to find. Um, this puts this in the environment for every command, right? 
so you can see that both env and my version of env or augmented version of env uh, will have this test variable in it. And if you ever decide that you want to remove the environment variable from the default environment, uh, you can do typeset plus x and then the name of the variable. Right, so now we don't have that uh, test variable in there. You can see that I've got <laughs> this var variable in here still, but uh, that was not what we were doing. Uh, that was not the variable that we were using. So now both of them should be gone, and they are. So that's pretty much it for the environment. Okay, so what about arguments? Um, arguments are essentially whatever you list after the command line, or after the command on the command line. And so I've written uh, a little program that will uh, print the number of arguments that are passed to it, uh, as well as what all of those arguments are, um, one per line. So if I type one, two, three, you can see we've actually got four arguments, um, and then one, two, and three are the second, third, and fourth arguments. Um, the reason for this is that um, your shell and just the convention in general is to put the, the name of the program actually as the first argument. Um, and then technically this is called the zeroth argument so that this is the first, this is the second, and this is the third. Uh, but there's four total because we start counting at zero. Um, Usually, um, whatever you type after the command uh, will be given directly to the command. However, there are certain convenience things that you can do that will change this. And essentially, um, there are certain special characters that the shell uh, treats differently. So, um, <clears throat> If you want uh, to pass some of those special characters to your program without the shell interpreting them, you need to quote them. And the full list um, you can find in the uh, KShell manual page. And it is essentially um, spaces. So space, tab, and new line, and then less than, greater than, pipe, semicolon, parentheses, ampersand, and uh, these characters. So backslash, double and single quotes, hash, dollar, backtick, tilde, braces, star, question mark, and left bracket. So, um, you can see that if I do this, I get a lot more arguments than I expected. Um, so I'm not going to go into what this little star means, but I'm just going to first tell you that if you want um, something to get n not to get interpreted by the shell, uh, you can either put a backslash in front of it or uh, you can surround it by single quotes. Um, the single quotes option is nice if you've got a lot of special characters. So if I uh, want to have some spaces in my argument, I can put it in single quotes and then this will get passed as one argument to the program. Um, double quotes will also work um, for most things, except double quotes um, do interpret uh, some special characters on the inside, but not all of them. Uh, so I'll get into that. I'll have to do a whole separate video on 
convenience features of the shell. But essentially, whatever you type after the command um, is your arguments. And uh, if you have any special characters that you don't want the shell to interpret, you need to quote them. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is that the way that you determine which or what arguments can influence the behavior of the command is by reading the manual page for the command. So you can see that we've got uh, a list of things preceded by a dash. Things preceded by a dash uh, in the manual page are called options. And you can specify them either as uh, single arguments or as multiple arguments. So for example, doing ls-li is the same thing as doing ls-l-i, right? So that's the second version technically passes two arguments, and the first version only passes one, but programs know how to handle this, and it's just a convenience feature, essentially. Um, that's it for arguments in the base case. Okay, so the last thing that I need to talk about are file descriptors, or maybe just descriptors is a better term. And <clears throat> a descriptor is just a non-negative integer that has been associated with a method of input and output or output for a program. Now, how programs do this isn't really important for us, uh, but the important thing that you need to know is that uh, programs are designed, um, most programs anyway, are designed to uh, get their input from file descriptor zero and send their output to file descriptor one. And uh, these are common, it's so common that this happens that file descriptor zero is called standard input and file descriptor one is called standard output. Uh, there is also a file descriptor two, um, which is where programs are by default usually designed to send their error messages. Um, now, <clears throat> if you don't do anything to change this, then uh, a program will inherit its uh, descriptors from its parent program. Uh, all of them, not just standard input, output, and error. Um, so the shell is the parent program of programs that you run. And when you're running it interactively, like I like you know you're normally going to be doing, um, when you're not running a script where <clears throat> the input for the shell is a file, um, standard input is your keyboard, right? That's where the shell is getting its input from. And standard output is your terminal screen, right? Um, you, you know, uh, when you type commands, uh, the shell and commands that you run by default send their output to your terminal screen, as well as error messages. Uh, standard error is also set up to be your terminal screen. Uh, however, uh, you can change this, right? So the way to change your standard output for a program is to put a greater than sign and then just the name of a file that you want the output to go to. So if I do ls greater than output, and you can put a space there or not, it doesn't matter, uh, you'll see that nothing actually gets put to the screen, but if we read output using less, you can see that we've got a list of the files that are in this directory in here. And 
that's you know that's kind of nice uh you can you know save output of certain commands to a file um you can also change a uh, standard input for a command now ls uh and anyway the way that you do this is by doing uh less than and the file that you want uh, to be standard input for the command. Now ls doesn't care about standard input. Uh, it doesn't actually read from standard input because it's getting its information from the file system. It doesn't generally care about uh, your keyboard or like you know text files that you might be giving it. It cares about what's in your file system, what's in the current directory, or what's in a directory that you give it on the command line. Uh, but there is a program that is designed to read from standard input by default called fgrep. And what fgrep will do is it will search every line of standard input for whatever uh, text you give it as its first argument. So I'll do something like, I don't know, text as the first argument. And because I haven't changed what standard input is, it's still going to read from the keyboard, right? So when I hit enter, if I type stuff, nothing really seems to happen. Uh, more stuff. But if I type text, fgrep will recognize that there was a line given to it on standard input that had text in it and it will print that to the screen uh, to its standard output and so if I type some context it'll do the same thing and sorry I accidentally hit a slash character there uh, so that kind of affected things um, and you can just hit uh, control D to get out of this, um, that'll get you back to your shell prompt. Control D uh, will send an end of file, uh, you know, notification uh, to whatever program is reading from your keyboard. So <clears throat> this is useful though because we can do something like output fgrep text and now fgrep is reading from the file output instead of from my keyboard. So when I do that, it says, hey, I didn't find any lines that had text in them in from standard input. Now, as an aside, the normal way that you would do this is fgrep text output because fgrep uh, won't read from standard input if you give it a second argument um, which is the name of the file to search for the first term in um, but you can see that gives us the same same result of nothing um, we could also do something like fgrep text uh, dot c um, oh I mixed up the arguments And this will search for any lines in output that have .c in them and print them to the screen, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, we could do the same thing by doing output like so and get the same output. Now, uh, as an aside, another aside, um, ls actually checks whether or not standard output for it is uh, a terminal screen or something else. And if it's something else, then it will only list one file or directory per line. Whereas if it's a screen, by default, it gives you this sort of uh, output in columns. Um, and that's important because instead of uh, sending the output of ls to a file and then running fgrep with output as its standard input, 
uh, we can combine these two steps so that we don't have to have some random file that we're only going to use once sitting on our file system. And the way that we do that is with a pipe character or with pipes. Um, and so I'm just going to remove output. And if I do ls and then a vertical bar, also known as a pipe, and then fgrep.c, what this pipe character will do is it will <clears throat> make it, it will set up ls's standard output to also be fgrep's standard input, right? So the output of the ls command becomes the input to the fgrep command which means that fgrep will search what would normally go to the screen when we type ls for any uh, files that have .c in them. And because this pipe is not your terminal screen, ls will list one thing per line. And so fgrep will find all of the files that have a .c in them this way. Um, and this is extremely powerful. You can use this in all kinds of ways. Um, we could do the same thing, and supposing that we had a lot of files that ended in .c, we could pipe this output to the word count command, which by default will list not just the words, but the number of lines, the number of words, and the number of characters that were given to it. So this is an extremely useful thing, and you'll see a lot of times lots of different, you know, pipes and, you know, redirections of input and output. Um, if you start reading shell scripts a lot, uh, you'll see this thing a lot. Um, and it's honestly, in my, it's in my opinion, the most important feature of a shell is that you can chain together commands to get them to do what you want. And if you learn how to use input and output redirection and pipes, uh, as well as some of the convenience features for specifying arguments, and you know how to control the environment, um, you are pretty much a power user of the shell, uh, especially for what are called one-liners. Uh, which are, you know, shell commands that only take up one line, maybe obviously. <laughs> but, um, you know, most of what you're going to be doing at the command prompt is one-liners. And if you know how to do the three things that I've covered in this video, uh, plus know how to use some of the convenience features that I'm going to feature in another video, uh, you'll know almost all that there is or the most important things that there are to know about the shell in my opinion so that's it for this one uh hit like if you like this video hit dislike if you didn't like it and in either case let me know in the comments down below why um also leave a comment if you have any questions criticisms or concerns and uh, as always if you want to get notified when i make new videos hit subscribe thanks peace